Hello, I'm Dr. Nathan Gellert. In this video about motivational interviewing, I'll be talking about the four core motivational interviewing skills. Open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summarizing. Everything you do as a counselor will be based on the use of one of these four skills. We have a mnemonic to help remember these skills, oars. As a counselor, you'll always be rowing with your oars. Using your oars is always the best way to keep forward movement with your client. Let's talk about each of them in depth. Open-ended questions. Here are some examples of open-ended questions. What's your primary concern? How will you know when things have started to get better? What is one thing that will make a difference for you? How did you know that you needed to come in today? What do these questions share in common? These questions, like all open-ended questions, cannot be answered with yes or no or a one-word answer. Let's look at some examples of closed questions. Can you spot the difference? How many drinks a week do you have? Did you have fun on vacation with your parents? Did you get to the doctor? Do you need more time to complete this assignment? Notice that all these questions can be answered with yes, no, or a one-word answer. In counseling, open-ended questions are a more robust intervention because they evoke broader content and deeper information from the client. When we ask closed questions, clients are much more likely to have a quick answer. With open-ended questions, clients often need to pause for a minute to think about their answer. Sometimes they even respond, hmm, that's a good question. These are desired responses because they invite the client to reflect inward, to elaborate, to share about their internal frame of reference. In this way, Open-ended questions demonstrate our commitment to partnership with the client and align our practice with the spirit of motivational interviewing. Closed questions stand in opposition to this spirit. Closed questions serve the simple purpose of information gathering. Let's look again at those example closed questions and see how they can easily be rephrased into open-ended questions. How many drinks a week do you have? becomes, what does an average week of drinking look like for you? Did you have fun on vacation with your parents? becomes, how was your vacation with your parents? Did you get to the doctor? becomes, what have you been thinking about getting to the doctor? Do you need more time to complete this assignment? becomes, how's it coming with your homework? Learning to primarily use open-ended questions instead of closed questions takes practice. Here are a couple of tips to help you succeed. First, remember that open-ended questions often begin with the words how and what. Closed questions, on the other hand, often begin with when, did you, or do. Second, resist the urge to rush with your clients. It's perfectly okay to take a moment to pause and think about how to phrase your question so that it's an open question. Clients will notice your measured pace and appreciate that you're thoughtful in your approach to engaging with them. The next OR's skill is affirmations. Affirmations are statements that highlight a client's strengths, resources, or efforts. Affirmations are used to acknowledge behaviors that indicate movement towards change, big or small. And this is an important point, because change rarely happens in one grand step. Typically, change occurs after dozens of small steps. For instance, for a client contemplating a new exercise regime, researching athletic shoes online might be an important first step. Affirming this action would acknowledge its importance for the client and help build their confidence about continuing movement towards change. Affirmations must be genuine. 
We've all experienced someone affirming something about us that wasn't quite accurate, that felt insincere. These comments get in the way of engagement and harm the therapeutic relationship. Importantly, affirmations are not the same as praise. Praise indicates that the person giving the praise is in an elevated position. The statement, I'm proud of you, may be well-intentioned, but it illustrates that the speaker is in a position of offering either praise or blame. Most clients genuinely appreciate being affirmed. Affirmations go a long way to build and maintain a strong therapeutic alliance between counselor and client. However, it's also important to remember that not all people respond to affirmations similarly. There may be cultural differences between you and the client. Pay attention to how your clients respond to your affirmations and adjust accordingly. When an affirmation appears to have not landed with a client as you intended, you might consider highlighting that fact in the here and now. Here are some example affirmations. You really care about students' learning. You had the courage to discuss that very hurtful situation. You're really giving time and thought to your sobriety. You're dedicated to supporting your child despite his learning differences. Notice how all these affirmations begin with the word you. The most powerful affirmations avoid I statements and direct their focus onto the client, not the counselor. Affirmations can be either general or specific. General affirmations touch on an aspect of a person's internal self-worth something Miller and Rolnick call prizing the client. For instance, in response to a client getting a high grade on a hard exam, you might say, you're really awesome. Specific affirmations comment on a particular strength, ability, or intention. Perhaps a student tried really hard to improve their success at completing their homework, even if they fell a little short of the goal. You might say, you really tried hard to complete your homework this week. It's important to remember that the opposite stance to affirming is a stance with the counselor shaming or blaming. We know that this stance is ineffective because it promotes the fight, flight, or freeze response from the client. Affirmations require a commitment on behalf of the counselor to constantly search for what is positive about the client. With some clients, this can be difficult, especially if you find yourself disliking the client. If you feel this way, embrace this phenomenological experience as a window into the client's life. If you're disliking the client, then people in the client's life may have this response as well. Work diligently to be curious about the client. Search for what is good, what you can like, and when you find it, affirm it you can empower the client to recognize strengths that they themselves might not see. In doing so, you are engaging the client as an ally towards change. Let's practice affirming a client. Jody is a client that has approached you concerning her desire to quit smoking. Jody states that she has tried patches, medications, and stopping altogether, but has had no success. She tells you that she would like to quit for her children, but really feels like smoking is something she gets to do for herself. What affirmations can you provide Jody? Here's a few that I've come up with. You've made great efforts to trying to quit smoking. You realized that it was time to quit. You care about your children. In the previous lecture, I talked a lot about the utility and importance of the next OR's skill, reflective listening. To briefly review, reflections involve restating back to the client what has already been said. They make a guess about the meaning of what the client has said. Reflections are incredibly useful to deepen understanding for both the client and the counselor. They clarify what's being shared, and essentially hold a mirror up to the client to help them get an accurate understanding of their own thoughts and feelings. 
Furthermore, reflections help the counselor connect to the client's experience, a primary way that we can convey empathy. Reflections should be used to highlight just the most important pieces of what's being shared. In this way, reflections can be used to guide the client towards change. Many clients want a quick fix for their presenting concerns, and the pace of reflective listening also helps clients to slow down. In the previous lecture, I also talked about how there are two types of reflections, simple and complex. Simple reflections add little to what has been stated by repeating or slightly paraphrasing the client's statement. In this way, they yield slow progress towards change. If a client were to say, I'm feeling pretty depressed today, you could respond, you're feeling depressed. You're feeling kind of down, pretty depressed. You can see how simple reflections don't really help move the conversation forward. Here are some sample client statements. I'd invite you to pause the video and practice responding to them with simple reflections. You can pause the video now. Here are some simple reflections that I came up with. You need to relax. You're concerned that your friend won't listen. Smoking isn't for you anymore. How did your reflections compare? Complex reflections yield a very different response from the client. Complex reflections add meaning or emphasis to what's been said and often make a guess about unspoken content. Take this example. I think I'm probably being too careful. My last test results were good. It just scares me when I feel pain like that. It reminds you of your heart attack. Notice that the counselor's response is a guess about the real, deeper meaning of what's been said. In this way, complex reflections accelerate the client's movement towards what's really at stake, and ultimately, hopefully, towards change. Here's another opportunity to practice reflections. Pause the video and write down one simple and one complex reflection for each statement. You can pause the video now. Here's what I came up with. It's been fun, but something's got to give. I just can't go on like this anymore. Simple reflection, you can't go on anymore. Complex reflection, you're exhausted. It's been a year since I've had an HIV test. Simple reflection, it's been a year since you've had an HIV test. Complex reflection, you're scared about what your results might be. You know, if she would just back off, then the situation would be a whole lot less tense and things wouldn't happen. Simple reflection, you're in a tense situation. Complex reflection, you want your sister to step up and do her part. How do these compare to your responses? Remember that there are usually multiple possible reflections. There's usually not a right and a wrong reflection. The final ORS skill is summarizing. Summaries are really just a specific form of reflection. You might think of them as being a reflection on steroids. Summaries are used to reflect larger quantities of information back to the client. In an hour-long counseling session, you might offer dozens of reflections to a client, but only a few summaries. The most natural and essential time to summarize is at the end of every session, at the end of every clinical interaction. This is an important opportunity to pull together what the client has said and present it back to them as a gift. Why is this important? Well, have you ever been to the doctor's office, received a lot of information, and as you're walking out the office, you can't recall exactly when you're supposed to take that new prescription, how many pills to take, or if you should take it on an empty stomach? I've had that experience, and it drives me crazy. Our clients can have a similar experience with us. Seeking help can be overwhelming. It's important at the end of 
every meeting to summarize, to highlight the key points that have been discussed. This helps the client to leave the session with a clear understanding of what's been accomplished and what they might expect next. In a single session, you might talk about more than one topic. Summaries can also be used to tie up one topic and help the client transition to the next one. Clients will experience that on some level, just talking out loud is beneficial. It's helpful for them to get the many thoughts out of their head and onto the table. Summaries can be used to help clients organize these thoughts. Summaries can be chunks of information that help nudge the client forward. As you work for weeks, months, and even years with clients, you'll find that something that's been said today might relate back to something that was shared in the past. Summaries can also be used to bring together information where the client may not be aware of important connections. And finally, summaries provide an opportunity for the client to let the counselor know what might have been missed, what still needs to be said. Here's an example summary. You discussed many important points today. You mentioned that you were unsure if you wanted to return to school for higher education, and you took steps to resolving your uncertainty by looking up program requirements and talking to individuals in the admissions department. You have considered how it might change your day-to-day -day life and seem willing to give it a chance. Notice that this summary is much longer than a reflection and serves as, well, a summary. Thanks for joining me for this video. In the next video, I'll be talking about the importance of exploring goals and values and interventions you can use to accomplish this. Please click the subscribe button to receive notifications when new videos are published.